All right, so we are going to be in the book of um, Luke. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go to the book of Luke, chapter 7, verse 36. Uh, the, w- my preaching is going to be a little bit different in terms of format today. Normally, I read the passage uh, completely in the beginning and then just kind of pull out a few principles and points from that passage. But today, uh, uh, for whatever reason, I decided to just kind of work through the passage by verse, by bits and pieces. And so uh, we're, we're not going to read uh, the whole thing at the get-go, uh, but we're just going to start uh, looking at verse 36. So before we start, let me pray, and then we'll get right into it. Lord God, we just thank you for your immense, for your expansive, for your humongous love for us, and that even for sinners, even for imperfect, even for broken and wretched people, that you allow us to come and to worship at your feet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for this grace upon our lives. God, we want to look into your word right now in this moment. We want to see, Lord God, the example of this sinful woman and gather, Lord God, information and knowledge about how we can uh, respond to your unmerited grace upon our lives. And we want to look at your example, Lord God, and and you would teach us how that we should love you more and to love one another more and more. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come and speak in this time, God, that the words of Spirit would just just resonate in the hearts of those who are gathered here, and the words of men would just fall deaf upon the ears of those who are here. Spirit overflow. Spirit overflow. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So verse 36, if you are there, this is in chapter 7 of Luke. Verse 36 says this, Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. I'm just going to pause there. We're going to camp out here for a little bit. Um, The Pharisees, what they were doing is, oh, actually, let's do some backtracking. What happened before the Pharisees uh, invites, or one Pharisee, Simon, invites Jesus to dinner? Uh, we see that Jesus, in the early part of chapter 7, he comes into contact and he heals uh, the servant or a slave of a Gentile, of a Roman soldier named Cornelius. And, and this is kind of a huge deal. I mean, he actually kind of insults, backhanded like an insult to the Pharisees, to the Jewish religious professionals. He says, of this Roman, of this Gentile uh, soldier, hey, I, I, I've never seen such great faith in all of Israel. Man, is it, that's like a, he, basically you're just saying, man, see this dirty Gentile? He has greater faith than even you have, bro. Dude, that, that's offensive. If I, was, if I was a religious professional during this time, and I heard, I was like, what? what are you talking about, Jesus? You know, he, has, he hasn't gone to, uh, you know, a seminary. He, hasn't, he doesn't go to the temple. How could you say that he has greater faith than me? And so the, the, the emotions and the anger of the Pharisees are being riled up by the things that Jesus is doing. He, uh, uh, what does he do? He heals, uh, he resurrects. He brings back from the dead. There's this kid who's already nailed up in the coffin. He's dead. But Jesus, as he touches the coffin, the kid comes back to life. That's kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, this ain't no David Blaine action. This is Jesus showing what kind of power, what kind of authority he actually has. If he has the power to raise someone back from the dead, then surely he has power over many, many, many other things. And we'll see that power being exercised at the end of this story that we are looking at today. And so the Pharisees are, are kind of getting a little agitated. They're getting a little irritated with this Jesus guy. He's going around. He's riling up the people. And the people are actually referring to Jesus. They're, they're attributing, they're elevating Jesus to this like celebrity-like status. It's like, oh my gosh, just Jesus. Surely he's got to be a prophet. Some of the people were saying that, oh my, Jesus is God. He's a prophet. He's a God. He is one sent from God. The disciples of John is like, hey, Jesus, are you the one who was sent? Are you the promised one who was sent to us? And so Jesus' popularity and his actual identity is being elevated and is rising in the eyes of the general population, but in the eyes of a select religious elite, they're like, yeah, no, Jesus, we we, we got we to gotta do something about this Jesus before he gets even more popular. And so this Pharisee, Simon, verse 36, he decides to invite Jesus to a meal. And, you know, and back in this time, inviting someone to a meal was a big deal. This is how you would initiate. This is how you would start. This is how you would sustain relationship. Having food was just a way to just to talk with somebody, to pour into a person's life, to get to know someone, to share prayer requests. 
you just would just do that over a meal. And for a Pharisee in particular, if you invited someone like a, like a rabbi or a public figure into your home to have a meal, this was considered a virtuous act. Like you would be seen in the public eyes being, wow, okay, wow, that, that Simon guy, that, that Pharisee, Simon, wow, he's a very noble, he's a very earnest, sincere guy. Wow, he's so compassionate, he's so hospitable, he's opening up his home to this Jesus guy. But we know, and Jesus knows that Simon's heart, there's something, there's an ulterior motive in Simon's heart. And he's, not, he's not welcoming Jesus to have a dinner with him uh, because he's, Simon's just genuinely interested in who this Jesus is because he wants to show hospitality. There are two things that are going on here in, in, in Simon's heart, in his mind, in his motivation. When he appears to be virtuous, he's appearing to be virtuous not for the sake of being virtuous, but the, for the sake of appearing virtuous in front of the people. He's doing these religious and honorable things so that he looks honorable and spiritual in front of the people. This is what we see the Pharisees doing over and over again. When they present themselves externally to be intimate with God, it, it gives the illusion that when people look at them, oh my gosh, you know that Simon guy? Wow, he's, he's, he's tight with God. When I, when I was going over this passage and even just examining this first verse of this passage, I was, I was like, Brian, how many times have you fallen into that same pitfall as the Pharisees have? Where they will do these religious, spiritual things in front of the eyes of people so as not to bring glory to God, but basically, I mean, if we're honest, if I'm honest with myself, to bring glory to myself. Wow, Brian... Pastor Brian, he's going to fast for 40 days? Dude, he and Jesus are like this. Man, that's so inspiring. I wish I could be more like Pastor Brian. The correct statement should be, I wish I could be more like Jesus. Oh, my God. Wow, he, Pastor Brian, he gave like uh, $5,000 to, to, uh, to Israel? Oh, man. I wish I could give $5,000 to Israel like Pastor Brian. What the Pharisees had the habit of doing was they would always in public do these religious things. And I'm not saying that giving to Israel, is, it is not bad to give to Israel. It is not bad to fast for 40 days to draw in greater intimacy with our Lord. But the heart of the Pharisee was that not for uh, deepening their connection with God, but it was basically kind of embellishing their connection with the people. To make themselves look holy, to make themselves look spiritual. You know, when Jesus talks about doing these other kind of spiritual practices, you know, when you, when you give, when you give charitably, Jesus may say, hey, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Basically, just, just give without making a big fanfare about it. When you fast, Jesus is like, hey, don't, 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 don't post on your Facebook, hey guys, I'm going to fast for 40 days. Because when you think about it, you know, we'll, let's, let's be honest with you. When we post up a status message, we're secretly hoping that people like it. Is this not true? Can we all just all agree? Can we just all admit this? That when I put up a link, when I put up a video, when I put up like this wise old fortune cookie saying or proverb on my Facebook, I'm secretly hoping that people like it. If no one likes it, my self-esteem hurts. <laughs> let's just be honest, right? <laughs> no one likes it. I've, I thought this was going to be such a wise and edifying, you know, a quote of the day and no one's liking it. Apparently it wasn't, you know, pro profound enough. To bring glory unto self is the heart of the Pharisee. And so when Jesus says, hey, when you fast, make sure that you look healthy. Make sure that you, don't, you look like you're not fasting. When you pray, don't go pray up in front of the sanctuary. Oh, there's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The, the Pharisees in the front of the sanctuary raised up, and, and, and he's praying a loud voice. And he's not praying a loud voice to pray to God. God, he's praying a loud voice so that the other people in the sanctuary can hear him praying just about how good, how much money I've given. Oh, Lord, God, I've, I've given so much tithes this month. God, it's not God's heart of hearing. What would what, you say, Sonny? <laughs> No, God can hear his prayers. But that Pharisee in the front of the sanctuary is not raising his voice so that God can hear. He's raising his voice for the people to hear. And then you have the tax collector in the back just crying to himself, beating his chest, forgive me for I am a sinner. Out of the public view, the heart of the Pharisee has been my own heart many a time. 
where I try to steal God's glory and bring it upon myself. This is challenging for us. And th- this is certainly challenging for a pastor because we, st- we, we stand up on this stage in front of all of these eyes. And this is one of those, this is one of those things that I struggle with when I preach. I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid of myself. That at the end of the sermon, when you say, oh, Pastor Brian, I was so blessed, I was so touched. My flesh is like, yeah, Brian, dude, you just killed it today. But you don't have to be a preacher in front of, preaching in front of people to fall into that trap as well. Brothers and sisters, the heart of the Pharisee that we see here is the one that tries to bring glory, rob the glory from God and bring it upon himself. In our daily action, in our daily interactions with people, how are we just bringing more glory unto him and and decreasing ourselves so that the glory that is deserved, that is due to him, goes to him and him alone and not to ourselves? I think that's something we need to be mindful of in our daily practice, in our daily interactions with one another and with our God. And he deserves it all. He deserves it all. And we are in no place to rob any of that from him. In no place. So the heart of the Pharisee we see just kind of being laid out from the beginning. Uh, the Pharisee's house and, he, and the reclining at the table. Now we've got to understand a thing about the environment, about the context. When they're having this meal, they're not uh, uh, seated at a table like you normally are seated at a, you know, a table that's like waist high. And there's chairs and you know, you're just kind of sitting there. The table that we, they were most likely situated at, and like even like you know the famous uh, Da Vinci painting, uh, The Last Supper, you know they're seated at a table. That that's completely biblically inaccurate. It looks great, but just completely whack. I know, seriously, mind blown. You know, um, what would most likely was is that the table was probably around knee high, uh, knee high, and they. Um, I'm speaking Chinese all of a sudden, and um, that was terrible. That was terrible. Uh, <laughs> And, but Josh feels me, Josh feels me. Um, and they had pillows. And so they would recline on these pillows. And so they would use these pillows and they would have their uh, upper body facing towards nearest to the table and then their feet would be uh, uh, um, extending out behind them. All right? This is how I ate in Afghanistan. When I went to Afghanistan, they actually didn't have a table. They would just uh, serve the food on the floor, but there were these pillows and we're just like lounging around. You don't eat uh, with utensils. You just dip, get bread, rip it up and just dip it in. And, and, and so what's the goal of this? You know, what's the goal of reclining at a meal? Like, the atmosphere that is set up, the kind of environment that's set up when you're reclining at a meal is like, hey, enjoy your meal. Take your time. Enjoy the food and enjoy one another. This ain't no fast food joint. You're in and then you're out. It's like take your time to get to know one another. Take your time to savor the food. And so the reclining at this dinner table. And what's interesting is that Jesus would even actually go accept the invitation to have dinner with basically his enemy. This is how wide and how expansive the love of Jesus is. That when his enemy, when the people who want to basically frame him, who want to kill him, who want to put him on trial, invites him to have a meal with him, he's like, yeah, let's go. Lead the way. I'll bring drinks. If someone called me up and said, hey, Brian, some guy that I just kind of annoys me, that's irritating me this past week, calls me, hey, what are you doing today for lunch? In my mind, I'm going to be quickly formulating an excuse. Oh, I got to go to a prayer meeting. Right? Because I, <laughs> I don't want to go with someone who I don't want to be with. But the heart of Jesus is so expansive, it is so wise. That even though he knows the, the ulterior motives of Simon, he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll dine with you. I'll dine with you. Yeah, sure. Show me the way to your house. Let's go. How great, how great is his love for us. And even, for when, even when we are in rebellion against him, even when we despise him, he still accepts the invitation. To come and be with us. That is remarkable. That is the love of God. That is the love of God for you, for me. 
verse 37, when a woman had, who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. A few things going on here. All right, let's talk about this woman. She is a sinful woman. Uh, scholars, some scholars will say that is, it could possibly be Mary Magdalene. Uh, that's not uh, a pivotal point that we the necessary the necessary bit of information that we need to know about this. All that we do know is that yeah, she was her life was marked was publicly marked was widely known to be marked with sin, most likely sexual in nature. So she's by a prostitute, uh, 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 promiscuous. She just had a lot of sexual baggage in her life, and people knew. The people around where she was, in her town, in her village, they knew about the shadiness, the junk in her trunk, in her life. So This is a sinful woman. Her life is sin-filled. And, and, and so she comes, a sinful woman comes to Jesus. Now, you may think it's kind of weird. It's like, hey, I thought this is like a private party here. You know, it's just Jesus and, the, and some of the Pharisees. It was common practice that when you, uh, as a Pharisee, you invite like a guest of honor to your home for a meal, they would actually open it up. They would actually open it up to the public. And so uh, one of the reasons why they would open it up to the public is that in order to uh, follow some of the Old Testament laws about having charity and compassion for the poor, that they would invite the public, the poor, and they could kind of hang out on the walls or on the fringes of the meeting, and then the poor, they could eat the leftovers. And so it's not unusual that uh, it's not unusual to think or to see uh, poor people or the outcasts to be on the fringes of this meeting. What is unusual is for someone who is in this outcast, who is in this uh, uh, marginalized group, to enter into, into the inner circle and to actually touch the feet of a rabbi, of this Jesus. So how does, how does she actually physically encounter this Jesus? She brings an alabaster jar of perfume. Alabaster is a rock. It is a mineral. It was commonly used or carved to become like a vessel or a container. And they would put in this container, you know, just kind of precious ointments or perfumes. Now, the thing to note about this is that uh, when you use this perfume, it's not something, especially in this jar, it's not something that you would uh, uh, you reuse over and over again. You just use like a small little, like two drops, and you're done. If you're going to break open the jar, you're going to use it all in that moment. In, in other words, you're going all in. You're, going to use, you're not saving any leftovers for anyone. If you're going to use it on someone, they're going to get all of it. So there's no holding back. There's no restraint. There is a sense of extravagance when she breaks that alabaster jar. There's a sense of lavishly pouring out love when she breaks that alabaster jar anoint the feet of Jesus. And when you compare that to how they commonly anointed people, what the, the oil that they would use to commonly anoint people would be olive oil. Olive oil is like so abundant. There was no, you just go down to the local Costco and you could buy olive oil, buy the bulk, buy the gallons. It's not like uh, Simon had a shortage of olive oil in his pantry. Olive oil is readily available. But you think about it, there would be no financial strain you use olive oil because it's so plentiful and so abundant. But there's a deep financial strain and impact when you use something as precious as its perfume. There is a sense of sacrifice that this woman uh, portrays and puts on display when she breaks open that alabaster jar. And what does she do? She, with that perfume, she breaks it open. Uh, she goes to the feet of Jesus, and she starts washing the feet of Jesus with their tears and then drying the feet of Jesus with her hair. The common practice, just as it was common to anoint someone with olive oil, it was common if you were a good host, worth your salt, at the bare minimum, you would get your household servant to wash the feet of your guest with water. Bring out the bowl of water, wash the feet of the guest, and then dry that feet's, uh, uh, the guest's feet with the towel. That's the bare minimum to show like you're at least semi-hospitable. 
But what does this sinful woman choose to do? She washes with her tears and she wipes with her hair. What is she saying? Throughout this whole encounter, she doesn't say, there's no, rec- she, there's no recorded word. She doesn't say anything, but she speaks volume. She speaks volumes through her actions, through what she actually does. What is she saying through her actions? What is she saying when she falls down at the feet of Jesus? She is, she is valuing her worth. She's saying, God, Jesus, I, I'm not even worthy enough to use water to wash your feet. I'm not worthy enough to even use a towel to dry off your feet. All I have, all I can offer you, God, is my own tears and my own hair to wash and to dry your feet. In in, in effect, a household servant, they're already low in society. A household servant has a higher status than even I do, Jesus. This is an act of humbling, of decreasing the self. This is the posture that she takes before Jesus. And then then with with the alabaster dryer breaking it open, she's saying, Jesus, you are worth it. You are worth it. You are worth it. Even though I will take a financial hit, even those who will call me financial stress, you are worth it. Jesus, you, I'm pretty sure you would have been perfectly pleased and you would have found it perfectly acceptable if I anointed you with olive oil. But Jesus, my love for you cannot match to the abundance that is found in olive oil. I want to love you extravagantly. I want to love you until it hurts. So she gives, she breaks that jar to use completely all on the one who believes, who can forgive her, the one who she believes can save her. This lavish, this extravagant, this humility-filled display of love and worship. How would our Sunday services look if people came to worship in that way? Like, you know, I I preached this in in the the previous service, and I, I asked the same question. And, and so we have, you know, as pastors, we, we, we have to sit through two services and two times of worship and praise. And I was just thinking, you know, when we were doing our 11.30 set, I was, just, I was just thinking about what I said. It's like, how would it look? And, and I was still trying to figure out how that, what that would actually look if, if the church, if the people of God came to worship in the same way that this lady came to worship. I think it would be radically different than what we commonly experience today. And what's even more remarkable, what really kind of destroyed me as I was preparing for this sermon was this. That all the while that uh, this woman is at the feet of Jesus, never once do we see Jesus going like, whoa, 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 don't touch me, girl. Get your dirty hands off me. Do you know who I am? I'm a rabbi. I'm a teacher. Your filthy, unclean hands is going to compromise my ritual cleanliness. And if I'm made ritually unclean, dude, you know how inconvenient that is? I've got to go separate myself from the community. I have to go through all the spiritual cleansing, and then I can re-enter back into the community. But Jesus, he allows her to come and worship him at his feet. He doesn't say a word. See, the Pharisee is the one who had the problem with this woman's sin. The Pharisee is the one who's like, oh my, you, do, do you know, whoa, hold up, hold up, girl. You, you, you're dirty. What, what right do you have to touch the feet of this rabbi? If that girl tried to touch Simon's feet, he'd be like, oh, get off me. Don't touch me. I want to touch you with a 10-foot pole. But Jesus, which just, just blows my mind. I, I, I missed this for all the years of my Christian living until I went over this, right, this past week. He doesn't flinch. He just simply allows the woman to come and to worship. He had, if anyone had any moral authority to call her out and to be repulsed by her sin, it would have been Jesus. 
But Jesus zips his lip. Makes no mention of her sin. Makes no mention of her brokenness. Makes no mention of her imperfections. And just allows her to come and to worship. It is the Pharisee who's making a big deal about how broken, about how messed up, about how screwed up she is. In the same way earlier where I said that, many, that the Pharisee's heart has been my heart many a times, I can see myself taking on the Pharisee's heart as well in this kind of scenario. Or that I will be critical of a person's sin. And in being critical and judgmental of their sin, I will prevent them from worshiping Jesus. That is one of the worst things I think I could do as a pastor. Is to prevent, is to not allow someone to come worship their king. Man, I, if, when, I'm, when I'm in front of Jesus, if I, I, I would be terrified to hear him say, Brian, remember how you judged that person? That person walked away from worshiping you. I would be terrified to hear those words come from my Savior. I would be absolutely terrified. If anything, my, I want to facilitate people to come freely and to fall down at the feet of their Savior to come and worship Him. So what, what, how can we, what are we talking? It sounds so kind of you know, esoteric and ambiguous. You know, this past week, you know, this woman's sin was sexual in nature. This past week, uh, uh, Jars of Clay, there was, you know, there's a band called Jars of Clay, and uh, they've been around for, I don't know, about a decade or so. You know, a lot of hits and um, contemporary Christian music scene. And the lead singer just got in some sort of like Twitter argument kind of conversation about, like he was uh, raising questions about um, what's the problem with same-sex marriage. And, and, and so this whole kind of like backlash and, you know, Christians just, shooting Bible verses at one another and just, just, just the normal internet foolishness. Right now is not the time to, 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 to debate the, the, the rightness or the wrongness of same-sex marriage, but, but, but my question is, in light of what we are reading today and learning from today, is if a person were to enter into the sanctuary while Jesus is preaching and teaching, struggling with the sin of homosexuality. I think I could safely argue that Jesus is not going to be, hey, do you know what the Old Testament says about your sin? Do you know what this Bible verse says about your sin? If I learn anything from this passage, uh, I think Jesus would just let this person who's, who's struggling with this sin of homosexuality just come and just worship him. Now, it sounds, send your, send your emails if you disagree, brian at gmiem.org. We can, we can have this conversation later. But in just trying to be faithful to the example that Jesus sets forth in ministering to this sexual, uh, sin-filled woman, our modern-day equivalent, how would Jesus respond? How would Jesus allow that person to come and to worship. I would venture to say that many times that the modern church, especially in America, that instead of allowing people to come worship the one who can ultimately forgive them of their sin, we repel them. That rather than welcoming, we're disgusted by them. There is no sin so big, so large, that Jesus can be, oh yeah, that's just too dirty for me. I can't deal with that. <laughs> I need some backup. No, Jesus don't need backup. There is no sin that Jesus is disgusted or just going to be run away from. Whoa, whoa, yeah, yeah, let me, let me, I'll get back to you in a week. The heart and the posture of Jesus is, hey, all right, you're dirty. Well, I'm the one who can clean you. You're messed up, I'm the one who can fix you. How can people get fixed? How can people experience cleanliness? How can people experience wholeness? We don't let them in the front door. We push them out. 
by our pharisaical attitudes. I'm trying to be faithful to what I see in this text. I'm not trying to add any sort of political commentary. I, as much as humanly possible, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I want to follow the example set forth by my King, by my Savior, and how He did His ministry. How did He minister to sinners? How did He minister to sinners? Jesus answered him. This is verse 40. So Jesus knows um, what's going on in Simon's heart and what Simon is thinking. And so Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he counted the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly. This parable that Jesus tells, just, uh, just, just brilliant. Jesus is just the, the best communicator. You know, I, I said in the other service, if Jesus was like on the speech and debate team in high school, he would have just owned everybody. Uh, there's just no contest with Jesus. He'll just straight up, just straight up humiliate you. <laughs> it's like, uh, drops the mic. <laughs> Jesus out. Um, so he tells this parable because he knows what's going on in Simon's heart and in his mind. A denarius has a day's wage. It's about 100 We'll just say it's $100. And so there's a guy who owes, what, 500, or 500 uh, denarii and another is 50. So we're talking about, what, 50,000 versus 5,000 bucks. And so there, there's a considerable gap, right? There's, it, it's almost apples and oranges. There's a big difference in terms of the uh, uh, difference in the amount. But what is interesting about this parable, and it actually reveals something about humanity's condition, is that both men are in debt. Both men are in debt. Regardless of the amount, at the end of the day, they're still in debt. And if they do not pay off their debt, they will be bankrupt. They will have to... Uh, uh, encounter the repercussions of their financial indebtedness. They are both in debt. The story of the human condition is that we are all in debt. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one of us, not any one of us, are free from the debt of sin. We, are, we live out our days in moral and spiritual depravity and debt. And there is only one who can release and cancel that debt. And the, the, the thing about this story, it continues the gospel uh, uh, dialogue. And, and we see that this money lender recognizes, and these debtors, they recognize, say, there's nothing I can do to get myself out of debt. I cannot work enough overtime hours. I can't, I, I can't find enough jobs to get myself out of this debt, to pay off this $50,000, or to even pay off this $5,000. It is simply by the grace of this money lender that, I am ca- that my debt is canceled. Is this not the same predicament that we are in spiritually? That the debt of my sin weighs so heavy upon my life that there is nothing I can do. I cannot go to church enough. I cannot read the Bible enough. I cannot read enough Bible verses. I can't go to seminary long enough. I can't go on enough mission trips to erase, to cancel my debt. The only way that I can cancel my debt is by throwing myself at the feet of the one who can cancel my debt. Why? So that I can't boast. There is nothing good in me. There is nothing good in me. But that's not the end of the story because he is good. Because he is good. It doesn't matter if I'm good. My badness doesn't matter anymore. And so for the person who, who understands the depth of their sin and what kind of predicament they are in, is the, and when they have been released of that, it is that person who understands and appreciates and responds to this gift of forgiveness with love, with the kinds of actions that we see that's evident in this woman's worship of Jesus.
there was nothing that this woman could do to earn her way to, to clean her slate. And so when she heard that, hey, Jesus just raised somebody from the dead, she's beginning to put two and two together. Hey, if this man can raise the dead, if he could do something as supernatural, as otherworldly, as powerful as raise a dead person back to life, then surely he can forgive sins. The empty tomb, the empty tomb, the empty tomb on that Easter morning shows, just, shows us just how much power Jesus actually has. The greatest weapon, the greatest, if Satan had a, gr- the, a great weapon, the greatest, most possibly the effective weapon that Satan would have to wage against or to use against uh, Jesus is death. But we know, we know how ineffective that weapon was. So if Jesus pretty much eradicated Satan's best weapon, we know who's large and in charge. This woman realizes, hey, this man just did the unthinkable. If he can do that, then he can do, he can do a work in my life. He can bring about newness in my life. You know, at the end of this, I'm just going to jump quickly to the end. You know, of verse 50, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This, peace. this idea of peace, of shalom. In the Garden of Eden, there was shalom. There was harmony. There was unity with God. And we see that when sin entered the world, that shalom, that completeness, that wholeness was broken. And so when Jesus enters into this life and allows this woman to enter into his presence, he says, hey, your faith is saved. Now go in peace. Go in wholeness. Go in newness. Go in life. Jesus is in the business of looking for those who need life. And he's not stingy in giving out life. He's not holding back. All that is required is For by grace you've been saved, by faith, not by anything that you do, not by any works. Just simply believe in faith and fall at his feet. Verse 44, then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace we see here is this direct connection between love and forgiveness. That the amount a person was forgiven is directly related to and influences the amount a person would love. And so if you are unable to love somebody, that says something about your understanding of what it means to be forgiven by the blood of Jesus. There is a direct correlation between how much you love And your understanding of the complete and thorough work of his blood upon your life. How are your love? How is your love? How is your willingness to forgive others in your life? How is that connected to your status as being a forgiven son or daughter of the Most High? I'm going to invite my brother Joe up right now. And he's going to kind of flesh out this idea of how love and how forgiveness are connected and how they influence one another. He's going to be sharing a little bit about, um, I'll I'll just let him tell his story and tell him him his story. So go ahead, Brother Joe. Uh, Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, My name is Joseph Pugh. Summer Globe. Oh, wrong context. (laughs) Wrong context. Go to TD, everybody. Um, uh, I'm, like, so nervous right now. I didn't didn't expect to be so nervous. uh, All right, so... Uh, just to kind of give it some contextual background, um, 
I have an older brother. His name is Elmer Yu. And, uh, uh, he was the, in my personal life, in my relationship with him, he was uh, two and a half years older than me. Uh, in my personal relationship with him, he was the disciplinary one in my life. As in, anytime I got in trouble, he would get beat, and therefore I would get beat. Or if he got in trouble, I would get beat. So he disciplined me in my life. And not only that, um, uh, the, the main thing that I always remembered about him was he was always at church, he was always serving. And uh, for me, when I became a Christian, when I got saved in my mid to later years in high school, he was my role model. He was kind of like my Christian hero. And so, so this past January, uh, a couple months ago, I, uh, the Lord, was, as I was praying in the mornings, uh, God uh, kind of gave me a thought uh, concerning my brother and, 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 and that kind of story, uh, but I kind of pushed it off to the side. I just didn't want to think about it until um, Pastor Shine, uh, the week before Easter Sunday, spoke on a message on forgiveness. And so uh, before I go into that story, just to kind of give you guys some background as well, um, Eight years ago, June 30th, 2006, it was the last day of uh, Summer Glow of Love, or uh, uh, Thrustius. And uh, as we were coming down, I heard the news that my brother had got into a motorcycle accident. And um, what ended up happening was, um, after I heard the message from Pastor Shine, um, I was just so convicted in my heart that, uh, that God was putting into my mind the, the individual, the driver of the truck that my brother had crashed into, and it's been eight years, eight long years, and, uh, but before I go into that story, I, I'd like to throw a disclaimer, uh, I may go a little detailed in terms of the accident and how uh, my brother had passed away uh, in 2006, uh, so after this, hearing the message, uh, Tuesday morning, I, I woke up, uh, after morning prayer, I came in, and God was just pressing on my heart, pressing on my heart, so I dug up the archives uh, of my brother's death certificate, the traffic collision report, uh, the police report, and all the sorts. And as I was reading through it, it was really heavy. It was really tough to kind of like relive almost uh, what happened eight years ago, even though God has set me free, even though, you know, like I've closed that chapter in my life. Um, as I was reading it, I found out how he passed away, how he died physically. And I'm sorry if it's a little too detailed, but... Uh, I hope it kind of gives it a little bit more context. But so my brother, he was riding a motorcycle down on that cursed street called Gilbert, uh, right here, right before Artesia, in between Malvern and Artesia. And uh, he had crashed into a truck that had made a left turn. And um, in crashing onto, oh my gosh, I'm shaking. Uh, in crashing into the truck, uh, the front of his wheels crashed into it. And then by an eyewitness account, uh, my brother Elmer had flew off his bike, slammed into the trunk, uh, the truck and literally quote bounced off of it and 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 just started sliding like far and uh, as I read the coroner's report um, he had bilateral rib fractures uh, he had a laceration which is a, a really deep cut a laceration in his heart uh, his kidneys his spleen and he had multiple head fractures uh, so needless to say there was blood all over him and uh, uh, he was wearing his helmet, the whole works, and, uh, and so he died, he passed away uh, with chest trauma and head trauma uh, from uh, exasperation, suffocation, and bleeding out to death, and, and so that's what happened, and uh, so for the past eight years, myself and my family, we've been, you know, we've dealt with it, we've had to go through this, and, uh, but never once in my life have I ever thought about that driver of that truck. And so I'm digging up the archives, and I read all of this, and then I come to the, the man's name. It said, uh, James Thomas Blanford III. And I was just like, this is the guy. This is the dude. And um, underneath was his address and uh, a home telephone number. A home telephone number and a business number. And so I kind of held it on my phone, and then I went to Starbucks, and Angie Chang was there too. She was like right in front of me. And I'm um, seeking prayer from our, our college leadership. And I'm asking, hey, can you guys pray for me? I feel the Lord kind of leading me on to do this. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. You know, and it's been eight years, you know. And uh, so I'm at Starbucks, my second home, for those of you guys that don't know, um, sitting down on the table. And I just thought to myself, 
it's now or never, balls to the wall. You just got to do it. And so I dialed the business phone number, and I called, and then this guy named Noel had picked up. And as, I, as he picked up, I said, hi, you know, my name is Joseph. Uh, I'm looking for James Thomas Blanford III. And the, this guy named Noel says, oh, he doesn't work here anymore. And I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's too bad, you know. And he asks, you know, he inquires of why I'm calling, and, and he says, uh, and I told him, and I said, you know, uh, he was involved in a traffic collision, an accident back in 2006. And so the individual, uh, Noel, is like, oh, a motorcycle accident. I'm like, yeah. And before having this conversation, the reason why I, I felt so convicted in my heart after hearing Pastor Shine's sermon on forgiveness was uh, I never once in eight years uh, considered what this individual went through. Does that make sense? Because he, my, my brother crashed into him, and, and it was, and I, I can only imagine what this man had uh, gone through. And, and for the longest time, for eight years, over eight years, I, I never once considered this man. And, and the Holy Spirit was convicting my heart during that message, you know, and, and I just felt so guilty. And I just felt like I needed to ask this guy for forgiveness, and I need to apologize. And, and so I'm talking to his coworker, and I was just asking, yeah, you know, uh, he wasn't in an accident, and uh, his coworker was like, yeah, you know, he didn't take it too well, and uh, it was very difficult for him, and my heart started to just ache and break and break and break, and, and so I told him if he can pass off the information to HR to contact him, let him know that I'm contacting him, trying to reach out to him, so I hung up, and then here's a telephone number, a home phone number, and so I'm thinking to myself, all right, I should try this number at least. It's been eight years. I don't know if it'll work. And so I dialed the number, and then sure enough, it reaches to a voicemail, uh, an answering machine, some weird accent. I don't even know what kind of accent it was. So I left a voicemail saying, hi, my name is Joseph. Uh, I'm looking for James, James Thomas Blanford III. Um, uh, please reach out to me. My, name, my number is X, Y, and Z. Um, I hung up. And usually when it's a home telephone number, you don't really call back a second time, uh, let alone after you have uh, left a voice message. Uh, but I felt the Holy Spirit convicting my heart, call again, call again. And so I summed up the courage, and uh, I'm sitting there, you know, at Starbucks, kind of like, you know, on the table, leaning against the window. And I'm calling, and then uh, I, I call, and then the voicemail, the answering machine picks up again. And I'm like, as soon as I'm about to hang up, I hear a voice on the other line say, hello, hello. And I was like, okay, you know, and then the, the answering machine it finally stops and it clears up. And then this individual, this man on the phone, he, he, he picks up and he goes, hello. And I go, hi, uh, my name is Joseph. Um, I'm looking for James Thomas Blanford III. And then he goes, this is he. Um, I'm James. And in that moment, I don't know how long, it was probably like a second or two, but it felt like eternity. I, I took my phone away from my, like, my ears and I was staring at it. And I was like, oh, my goodness, this is, this is the man. You know, this is the man that... Uh, my brother had crashed into you. Like, this is the guy. And, um, uh, yeah, it felt like an eternity. And so um, I, I found the courage again somehow by the grace of God. And I uh, went to, back to the phone. I was just saying, hello, sir. You know, I'm not knowing what to say, right? Uh, I just telling him, Mr. Blanford, my name is Joseph. And I'm just calling you. I've been meaning to reach out to you for some time now. And um, I just wanted to apologize and ask for your forgiveness for not reaching out to you sooner. And he's kind of laughing, and he's like, okay, you know, apologies. Oh, that's, that's a great gesture, you know, like, these things are good. Uh, did I do something wrong? And he's laughing. And, and just by hearing his voice, I knew he was a compassionate and, and kind man. And uh, as I'm talking to him, I was like, no, sir, you know, that's, it's not that. It's just, you know, I just wanted to reach out to you and, and, and uh, just ask for your forgiveness uh, and apologize for not considering your heart and I just wanted to hang up you know like just get it done with man and just walk away from it and just no more and then he just asked me he said well do do I know you from so do I know you from work and and then that's when I said no no sir um and it was kind of like I was pausing and trying to compose myself I look like a crazy man huh, Angie? you know and uh, I'm like st like by this time I'm like violently shaking like my whole body I just couldn't Home, I'm just shaking everywhere on the phone, and um, oh man. So uh, he says, "Do I know you from somewhere?" I'm like, "No, sir." Uh, and I said, uh, eight years ago, in uh, on June 30th, 2006, you were involved in a in an accident." And then he, uh, over the phone, 
you can hear his vocal tone drop. And he was like, Elmer, you? And I said, uh, yes, sir. I said, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Joseph Yu. I'm his younger brother. And uh, there was a, a deep, uh, there was a deep, there was a deep silence across the phone. And um, we were, uh, we were uh, trying to compose ourselves, both of us, right? And I'm at Starbucks inside, and I'm trying to compose myself, you know, like, oh, don't look at me, people. And I'm just kind of like, you know. And we didn't say anything for a while. Uh, after I said I'm his younger brother, we just, we just, we knew what was going on. And, um, <laughs> and uh, we just called him, and I, I broke the silence. I, I just said, you know, Mr. Blanford, I just wanted to apologize for not reaching out to you sooner. And then right immediately, he says, don't you dare say that. Don't you dare say, you know, you... I owe, like, you owe me an apology. Don't you dare say that. And don't call me Mr. Blanford. Call me Jim. And uh, it was in that moment where uh, we were able to kind of talk things through. And, and um, I, I told him, I said, you know, on behalf of myself and my family, I just want to tell you, Jim, uh, we love you. Uh, we forgive you. And, and truly from my heart, I, I really am sorry that I did not consider your heart and, and what you went through because you must have gone through something like a deep hell in your life. And I just wanted to be an avenue of Christ's love for you and uh, to tell you and ask you for your forgiveness. And said, stop that, stop that. And, and, uh, and long story short, we were able to exchange those words, hey, I forgive you, I forgive you. Uh, and I told him, we love you. You are my brother. And, uh, and, I, I, and, and he was telling me his side of the story. So what had happened was he made that left turn into the broken yellow lane and we're having, like, this long conversation. We had a couple. And we were supposed to meet up soon this week, hopefully. And um, what happened was after my brother had bounced off his truck and started sliding, he, he saw my brother wearing his helmet. And he's like, okay, thank God he's wearing a helmet. He, he, you know, it shouldn't be that bad. And so he quickly parks his car and he runs to my brother. And uh, he literally gets on his knees and he grabs a hold of my brother. And he's telling me this. And I'm like. I'm dying now, you know, because I can imagine what's going on. And, and he just, he's grabbing my brother, and he holds my brother in his arms, and, and he still has his helmet on, and he can see through the, 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 the glass, and he can see the blood, and he can see everything. And he just knew in that moment, it's, it's done. It's done. And the only thing that he can do is just be there to, to comfort him and to hold him and, and just, you know, be there for my brother. And, uh, and so... My brother had died actually in his arms, and um, yeah, it, the rest of it was kind of a blur for him too, as well as it was for me that day. Uh, that's a whole nother story, but yeah, I just wanted to share that testimony with you guys. It happened about two weeks ago, and it was incredible. I mean, uh, there's so much peace and reconciliation, and, nice. and so much joy. You can't, I can't imagine, like, just. Actually, I can't because I'm living it. There's that reconciliation and that love and joy and, and this chapter being closed. And, and God was telling me, you know, uh, uh, love and forgiveness can't be separated. It can't. For, for me to tell an individual, I love you, I need to genuinely forgive because love keeps no record of wrong. And if I truly forgive someone, as Pastor Brian shared, it, it really shows that I, I do love sincerely the way Christ has taught us to love. And if I were to say that I love someone but I can't forgive, then that just goes to show that my love is actually shallow. I would even go so far as to say it's not love to begin with. And so just as a challenge and an encouragement to all of you to, today, my brothers and sisters, uh, if there is someone that needs forgiveness in your life, um, please ask for forgiveness because as Pastor Brian said, we're all indebted. And uh, I, I, I can't expect that person to... You know, I can't say, I forgive you. I can't do that. I have to ask him for forgiveness first. And then in that moment, God just moved. Yeah, bless you guys. Amen. Man, ministry and ministering to people in a way that Jesus ministered to people, it's going to be messy. It's going to be bloody. But for, for it was Jim, right, Joe? Jim, he runs to Joe's brother, Elmer, when Elmer is bloody, and he embraced. Instead of running away from this mess, he ran to him and held him. 
when the woman was steeped in her sin, she comes up to Jesus, and Jesus stands there and remains and doesn't run away. He's like, hey, get off of me. You're dirty. He just stood there and allowed her to worship. And Joe, he finished with the challenge. You know, if It's not that, hey, I need to forgive you. Maybe the appropriate place, the initial place that we need to start from or with is, would you forgive me? My, my, father, my father passed away back in uh, 2007, and his last words to me on this earth, his last words to me on this earth was, it's okay, Brian. Now, what prompted those words? He, he died of liver cancer, and it was uh, in September, and I could see him. He was laying downstairs, and his skin is sticking to his bones, and you see him, like, whenever he ex- exhales and inhales, it's like a chore for him to breathe. And I was just getting something in the kitchen, and, and I was just kind of looking at my dad, and I was like, man, what a pathetic-looking sight. He had lived his whole life in rebellion against God, thinking that he could save himself. So he ate right, he exercised. He was a self-made man. But when he was struck by cancer, <laughs> mortal, or cancer is a great equalizer. It's a great humbling agent. And all throughout those years, my father was in rebellion against God. I know that I was going to church at that time. And I thought I was the righteous. I thought I was the good one. I I was like that Pharisee. Hey, God, look at me. I'm better than my dad. But I realized that when I looked at my dad, no, no. I can't lose this opportunity to ask for his forgiveness. So before I even knew it, I found myself around my, my, my arms or wrapped around the, 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 the neck of my father. I could feel his bones pressing against my body. And I just wept and I said, I'm sorry, Dad. I'm sorry, Dad. I'm sorry, Dad. Because all those years preceding that, I led my life in judgment of him. He doesn't know you, God. So what right does he have over my life? But if I called myself to be a son of God, what right did I have to cast judgment on him? The first initial reaction, the posture of Christ would have been to go to him, to humble myself before even this man that I thought was a sinner of the king of sinners in my life. So I said, I'm sorry, Dad. I'm sorry, Dad. And I'm sorry, Dad. And the last, he, with his, I don't know how much energy it took, but he reaches around and pats my back. And the last words that he says to me on this earth, until I meet him in the next life in heaven, he says, it's okay, Brian. It's okay, Brian. It's okay, Brian. Understand the depth of the forgiveness that has been so graciously given to you. And let that understanding take you to a place of seeking forgiveness of those who you need to be forgiven from. We are in no position, we have no moral authority to hold anything against anyone. And so would you go this week, it could be a dad, it could be a mom, it could be a neighbor, it could be a co-worker, it could be a friend, it could be a cousin, I don't care who it is. But if you're human, you got somebody. In the same way that woman sought the forgiveness before the one who she knew could grant her that forgiveness with such lavishness, with such humility, with such extravagance. Would you go before that person or people and sit at their feet and say, hey, I'm sorry. The promise of Jesus is that when we reside and when we walk in His forgiveness, there is peace, there is wholeness, there is shalom. Praise God. Praise God. This is my prayer for you this week, that you will experience the shalom as you seek out and you walk in His forgiveness. Let's just spend some time and, I, and let's just pray for that person that you have in your life.
you just pray for that person in your life? Pray silently, pray aloud, whatever. Pray for a humility of heart and for an extravagance of love to overflow, not just in that relationship, but in all your relationships. That as you walk in and as you soak in the forgiveness that has been so freely given to you, that you would freely give out that forgiveness and live in that being forgiven, in that forgiven status all the days of your life. So let's spend a few moments in prayer. rise to our seats or our feet and if we could sing on uh, the beauty for ashes if we can just sing that song there is hope in Jesus because he can turn and change ash that which is dead that is with that was without life and turn it into something that is filled with life and that is life giving